from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, welcome. I'm Thea Austin, the Public Events Coordinator for the American Folklife Center here at the library. And on behalf of the entire staff, I'd like to welcome you to this August homegrown concert for 2009. Um, Coolidge, as you may know, has a very long history of um, presenting traditional and roots music. We've featured, over the many years, um, Jelly Roll Morton was here in 1938, interviewed by Alan Lomax, who, uh, when he was here, he played the piano and told his story. And those recordings were actually recently turned into CDs that won a Grammy a few years ago. We've also had uh, players like Josh White, the Golden Gate Quartet, Mississippi John Hurt, um, Dolly Parton, um, and then of course Bo the Beaux-Arts Trio and many classical musicians. So Coolidge has quite an august history. All of these uh, concerts here have been recorded. They're in our permanent collections. And this concert today that you'll hear will also go into the permanent collections of the American Folklife Center. So future students and scholars can listen and learn from the, the artists that we're presenting. So this would be a good time to turn off your cell phones because um, in 100 years you might have researchers listening to your special ring <laughs> if you don't. Um, this concert will also go on our website as a webcast along with the program notes. So it will be there also accessible anywhere you can get the World Wide Web. The Homegrown series was designed to feature the very best in traditional music and dance from around the country. And we work with, collaboratively with the Millennium Stage at the Kennedy Center. These folks performed there last night at the Millennium Stage. Um, and that's also on a webcast online. We also work with many talented um, and dedicated state folk arts coordinators and ethnomusicologists all over the country. And they help us identify and bring to DC representative and wonderful artists so that we can bring them to you. Today we're presenting South Indian Veena music from Oregon. And to introduce the group and tell you a little bit more about the tradition, let me now bring on Mark Levy, an ethnomusicologist at the University of Oregon. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Lee from the University of Oregon School of Music, and there are very informative program notes that you can look at, but I'll just summarize a few points. You'll be uh, seeing a presentation of classical, classical music of South India, and when we talk about classical music in India, we're talking about traditions that developed in temples and courts over the period of several thousand years, usually through the patronage of elite social classes. Due to greater Islamic influence in the north, classical music in India gradually diverged into two separate traditions from about the 13th century on, what we call Hindustani music in the north and Carnatic music in the south. So today is a presentation of Carnatic music. Although there are significant differences between these two traditions, they're both based on uh, ideas related to uh, compositions and improvisations, in particular melodic frameworks called ragas, and rhythmic cycles called talas. And as the concert proceeds, uh, I'll be asking questions of the performers and we'll be explaining things and helping you know what to listen for. Shrivijya Chandramoli, who plays the plucked stringed instrument Veena, is a 10th generation performer in the Kare Kudi tradition of Carnatic music. The Veena, a plucked stringed instrument of the lute family, is associated with Saraswati, the Hindu goddess of learning and the arts, who is often depicted seated on a swan or peacock playing this instrument. Perhaps you've seen pictures of that. Shrivijya began learning Veena at the age of four from her mother, Rajeshwari Padmanabhan. In addition to this traditional training, she received a master's degree in music from the University of Madras. She's also an experienced vocalist and visual artist. Shrivijya has been living in Portland, Oregon since the late 1980s, where she teaches South Indian music in her home. She'll be accompanied on a double-headed, barrel-shaped drum murdangam by Puvalur Shriji. Puvalur studied South Indian drumming with his father, P.A. Venkataraman, and has performed and recorded with leading artists from both South and North Indian traditions, as well as Western performers such as Yehudi Menuhin, Mark O'Connor, John Bergamo, and Glenn Valise. He's currently a member of the faculty at the University of North Texas and has taught at the California Institute of the Arts 
and San Diego State University. Also appearing on stage will be Srividya's sons, Kapila and Sushruta. Both are advanced students of their mother and are continuing the family tradition of veena playing. Today they will be playing an instrument called tambura, a plucked stringed instrument that provides a constant drone against which the melody moves. So let's welcome our performers.
Thank you. Shadivija, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what we just heard. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> I wish to thank the Library of Congress for making this possible. The first piece that we opened today is a melody set in the raga called Nate in a cycle called Aditala, which is eight beat cycle. You heard me sing along with my instrument. I sang in a language called Sanskrit. This particular composition extols the goddess of learning, which Mark spoke about at the beginning of the program, Saraswati. You might have heard the word Saraswati towards the end of the composition, where I paused singing the line, Saraswati. Sadite shikanuta guna jale Saraswati. It extols um, Saraswati who sports the Veda in her hands, the book, Pustaka, in her hands, and describes the beauty in her face, the goddess of learning with such a uh, illumination. So this is a competition uh, composed by Puliyur Dursami um, an ancient composition which my family tradition treasures very much. It's a beloved composition of the tradition. Thank you. Perhaps you could just say a few words about the Veena in terms of how it's put together and how it's played. The instrument is, itself is made out of jackwood. <coughs> which is a tropical tree. All the South Indian instruments are made of jackwood. The marudangam is made of jackwood. The tambura that you see are all made of jackwood. Nowadays, we have also started using red cedar in place of jack. Um, this particular instrument, the age of the wood is about 70 years. Veena is a 24 fretted instrument with brass frets that you see that are fixed on top of beeswax. This is something that we replace depending on how often we use the instrument and how much uh, it is used in concerts. So the building of the wax fret happens once in two years or every year. In Portland, Oregon, we are fortunate to be able to do that every year for some instruments um, due to the heavy use and also the learning process that all the students go through in building the frets uh, for the instrument. It is a seven stringed instrument with a fine tuning on the right side and the major tuning on the left side. There are two uh, resonators. One is called the kudam. The other is a lap rest, with, which is a secondary resonator. And you have a dragon head on one side, which is symbolic of um, fertility in Eastern culture and uh, warding of evil spirits. Um, so this, this is how the instrument is usually constructed. Sometimes instead of a dragon face, you might also see a lotus or a peacock face. And if the dragon is facing upward the other way, it is used by spiritually uplifted persons. So you can see I'm not so much spiritually uplifted yet. <laughs> So my dragon faces down. <laughs> and I will let Sriji also talk a little bit about his percussion instrument. The strings are uh, tuned to, uh, today we have D sharp and five below D sharp. Since the instrument is heavily pulled and slided, the tuning is often a um, little bit uh, off. So the performers have the freedom to stop anywhere in between and retune themselves. And the drones that you see behind are the ones that are constant, like a white screen. And they will be constantly playing the drone on which the melody is projected. So. 
without the drone, we are basically free, but with the drone, they envelop us and we are completely in their world to play the melody. So sometimes the drones suggest what raga you could play. So the concert that you're hearing today is completely unplanned, not discussed. We still do not know what is going to come next, but the drone suggests maybe we should try this. Maybe we should change. So it gives us a mood to form what we want to do. not really that durable, they switched to the jacket. And from the tuning, I will uh, start because uh, this drum is tuned, and that's what it suggests, it's an ancient drum because I used a rock and a stone to tune the drum. And there are like 16 heads, I need to tune that, so it's the same thing. Uh, it's the, 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 the Indian instruments are very moody, so it does keep tuning them quite often, so that you will find that there's a disturbance, but they go out of tune quick, there is a high light goes up. for each and different pitch. So the first question they asked me when they called me for a concert is what is your pitch? And then how much you pay? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that is as important as that, this pitch thing. And basically if I open it up, you can see just like a, a, a jackwood barrel shape and it is hollow inside. And this is my primary head, which we call the valangale or the white head. So that's where all the most of the strokes are made. The left side is my bass head. And this one you don't get to see much because it does not look that pretty. And so we hide it. It gives the bass tone. Though it's a small head, it has the bass tone because I apply this cream of wheat. I make a paste of cream of wheat. I apply that there in the center so it gives the bass tone. And since the cream of wheat is a little wet, you know, it uh, gives a more like a resonant tone to that. And in the traditional style, this will be tied with the water buffalo skin. I mean, in Texas, they're just red. So I end up putting a, a resin nylon here. It works fine. So. so that's the construction. And this one, is just to tighten it up, I put this one. And normally, you know, I can tighten it up and take this away. It's not a necessary feat. So, and as far as the, the light, the most important thing about Murdangam is constructing the phrase like ta, ti, dum, nam. It's like alphabet. And you make a word, kita taka, taka tuna. And then you make like a sentence. Tanata, dinata, dinata, tanata, dinata, dinata, tanata, dinata, dinata, tanata, dinata, dinata. so I don't really care about what my hand plays, but I think everything in terms of the language, when, when, when I hear the song, I respond to that. And so that is the nature of this in instrument. Though it is a primarily a, a, a timekeeping instrument, we have the liberty to play in unison a lot of time with the vocalist player or the instrument player, because she keeps the time signals in her mind. She's not relay, uh, uh, relaying on me, so I, I have more freedom in this term to play whatever. Thank you so much. Perhaps you can say a few words about what you'll be playing next, the next piece.
next is a small composition by Tyagaraja in the Raga called Chitranjani, Naga Tanamanesham, where the sound, which is called as Nada in Sanskrit, is extolled as the primal source. And the seven notes that come out of this basic uh, sound is what is extolled in this composition.
So I think we're getting a sense of the way Indian music is put together is basically a, a very strong focus on melody, in this case provided by the voice and veena, rhythm on the drum and, and drone on the timbre. So there's really no harmony in a Western sense. It's melody, rhythm, and drone. So uh, the melody of a particular piece is always based on something called a raga. And the rhythm is based on something called a tala. I wonder if we could briefly give people <laughs> more of an understanding of what these terms mean. I mean, it's, it would take hours, but what's a raga? <laughs> <laughs> In Indian music, when we call something a raga, it is not just a group of notes, but there are certain personalities attached, some characteristics attached to each and every note, how they are embellished, and what role they take in the entire scale. That makes it a raga. Raga is something that colors your mind. So when you add the embellishments to the plain notes, for example, the composition that, that I just now played has a very restricted range. That is the range of this particular raga. And when the embellishment is given, it assumes a certain personality and it is also given by the text, the meaning of the text that adds more color to the entire composition. For example, it is based on a raga called Karaharapriya. It's a plain scale. We call it Karaharapriya. But if I add embellishments to Karaharapriya, the Karahara Priya Raga because of the embellishments and the personality that it gives. Thank you. There's a lot more to that story, but that's a good start. <laughs> so Indian music is a combination of the, the melodic aspect, Raga, and the rhythmic aspect, Tala. Puvala, maybe you can give us a little more of an idea of what, what Tala is. Uh, can I quickly say Tala is like the same, like in all the cultures of the time signatures, and the only major difference is in Indian music, everything is perceived as a, like a quarter note beats. So for example, we don't have a tala which would be like a 716 or 78, but everything will be like the, the lower the denomination will be always to be four. So if the 78, we call them a three and they have four. So it's all like a, it's basically standardized. And to keep tala, we use different hand gestures, like you can see people keeping tala, and so they are like in groupings. One beat will be like a clap, two beat is a clap and a wave, a four is like a clap, followed by the finger count. If you need three, only two fingers, five, four fingers, so on and so forth. And with this, we make like a compound structure. This tala we play is like a, in Western term, it's an eight four, but it's a compound uh, a time signature of four four, two four, two four, which makes it eight four. So the four four is displayed like one, two, three, four, a two four and another two four. So that is how the talas are constructed. And then we play on top of them like many different phrases which suits with the, with the song, which are like thought like a more like a phrases to us. And then we try to match with how the song goes. That is more about a, a brief explanation of tala. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about the next piece you'll be doing.
So far you heard us talk about what a raga is and compositions in South Indian music are. Um, we will embark on some improvisation called raga lapana, followed by tanam, which is a pulsating rhythm, and followed with a composition. At the end of the composition, Sriji will be playing a solo on the drum. I'm still evolving as to what composition I should pick, but as the uh, improvisation rolls on, we will figure out what it leads me into, which composition I want to take. I will let you know. Think about my position. <laughs>
This was a raga called Panto Rali with a scale. Which suits an afternoon. And the composition is a Thyagaraja composition, Aparama Bhakti, set to three beat cycle called Rupa Katalam. Since we are running out of time, I would like to choose a smaller composition and let Sriji explore on the rhythmic aspects of the composition. I played a little raga lapana followed by a pulsating tanam, which is typical of the instrument veena. The words that are used in singing or playing the tanam are anantam tanam, which means joy is the form of tanam. Thank you. 
Give a big hand for Sri Vijaya Chandra Muli and friends. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.